Hello and welcome back to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Great to have you with me. Episode 147 is an interview with Deb Sharp, founder and owner of EMS, Endurance Medical Services. EMS provides first aid and emergency medical care to athletes in endurance races. Deb is a critical care registered nurse. She currently runs the medical emergency team for all code blue and deteriorating patients. She is trained in major incident medical management, hospital incident medical management, lots of words here, and is the director and instructor for the Australian Resuscitation Council ALS programs, as well as the director and instructor for trauma, core training, and advanced wilderness life support. What an amazing woman, what a list of skills. I really love working on this podcast and interviewing so many people, interesting people like Deb. I hope you enjoy listening and get a lot out of it. And if you do, could you do me a huge favour and subscribe, rate and review? It makes a huge difference to me. Personally, it does because I like the reviews. It gives me a boost and and motivates me to keep working on this. But it also helps the podcast audience grow and thus ensure I can keep getting amazing people to interview. Thank you so much in advance. The link is in the show notes. Even if you just subscribe, that's a help. Are you sick and tired of being injured or running in pain? Ensure you are ready for racing in 2022 and come in and see the team at Health and High Performance. Love your running again like you should by heading to healthhp.com.au forward slash run. Oh, I almost forgot that bit. Or find them on Instagram, Health High Performance. I see Luke regularly and he helps keep me in good shape for running. I highly recommend him. My recent goal setting webinar went incredibly well and I got some amazing feedback on how much the participants loved it and got so much out of it. So I am now making it available for purchase for an extremely limited time. For $35, you get the recording and PDF of the webinar, as well as the accompanying booklets. Now this offer is only available to, until, if I can get the words out, this Friday, which is the 11th of Feb. And then the webinar will be removed from my shop to make way for some new products. So don't miss out again. Go to my website, peakendurancecoaching.com.au. The link, once again, will be in the podcast show notes. Sorry, I'll have to trek over there. And make 2022 your running year. Also, if you want to get more awesome running info, make sure you join the Peak Endurance Running Group on Facebook. It's a great place for all things and people endurance running. Of course, you can also go to my website, once again, peakendurancecoaching.com.au, link is in the show notes, to get on my email list. And I try to send out interesting emails as often as possible. Not too often, though. Enjoy the episode. Let's go. Hi, Deb, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. Um, yes, I have Ron here with me, obviously, and you Hello. know Ron. Yeah, I've known Ron for a long time. Yes, we know each other quite well. <laughs> yeah. And now, can you just tell the listeners a bit about yourself and your athletic background? <laughs> uh, I don't so much have an athletic background, is, but um, uh was a runner and I do still do a little bit of running, but not anywhere near as much as I used to. Yeah. Um, have done a few ultras. Um, mostly my uh, involvement with running was just more from a destination point of view. I like to use running to to travel and go and see places and things like that. So I did things like the Inca Trail Marathon and Angkor oh, Wat awesome. and all that kind of stuff. So it was more about destinations for me as opposed to racing or racing yeah. anybody. Um I just thought it was a good way to see parts of our country and other countries um, that you can only do on two feet. So that was my involvement with running. Um, And I'd very much like to keep doing it. (laughs) Yeah, Sorry? I'd I'd like to keep doing it or get back into it as I I would. But, um, yeah, the last couple of years has been pretty busy, I think. Yeah, yeah, fair Mm. enough. Now, um, can you just tell us when did you start EMS and, and why did you feel that there was a need for such a service? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. I think um, it was a combination of a few things. It was an identified need, I think, in doing um, some trail running events myself. Um, yeah. There was a, quite a number of events. I was always a kind of, in my good days, I was a middle of the pack runner, I think, but majority of the time I hovered towards the back. But I um, would commonly come into contact with people who were in need of some assistance. Yeah. Um, and I think quite a few times I got into a position where I would kind of stop racing and help people. And, and I think just in doing that, it kind of made me have an appreciation for 
how remote some of these races really are and the logistical difficulty of trying to get help to these people. Um, and it also, you know, I, I think just from my line of work, um, I always have that plan for the worst and that's almost like your insurance policy that it won't happen. So I always have that worst case scenario in the back of my brain um, and I'm always thinking a couple of steps ahead and, um, you know, just trying to make sure that I've got a battle plan there should I need to um, engage it. And I think, yeah, through doing a couple of events and having an appreciation for how difficult it could be um, and then becoming a race director myself, so putting a race together. Um, and Ron knows all about that. Yeah. <laughs> Ron took over the baton for me and started to race direct the beer run and you then start to really understand the, the duty of care that you have and the due diligence um, and your obligation to try and provide a safe race um, from many different facets, from a legal point of view. Um, also, you've got to do the right thing by local council uh, and the governance that they have. Uh, so you need to make sure that you tick all of their boxes. Um, and, and just the expectation of runners, you know, I know everybody goes out there and they do their training runs and the onus is on themselves to take care of themselves in those circumstances. But when people enter a race and they've paid an entry fee and, you know, they're putting themselves in a position where they might want to push themselves just that little bit harder or, or beyond what they normally would do, um, you know, then it's reasonable to expect that there's going to be support services there for them so that they can go beyond their um, limitations I guess or, or whatever their perceived boundaries are so I think the big stick out one for me was Tarawera uh, I was doing the 100 kilometer race over there um, and I came across a gentleman um, and and that race attracts a lot of international um, participants and I came across a gentleman that Tarawera always has a bit of a wasp problem I don't know oh, maybe okay. the race that one is but yeah you often see quite a lot there's quite a lot of nests and stuff along the back end of the course and this particular year, they were running the course from Kaiwatao back to um, Rotorua. And uh, they do go out and spray and things like that before. But, um, yeah, I come across a gentleman towards the back who'd been stung by quite a lot of wasps and was starting mm -hmm. to demonstrate signs of having an anaphylactic reaction. So I stayed with him and then I realised that I had no phone reception. Staying with him wasn't going to do any benefit because yeah. I had absolutely nothing with me that was going to be able to help him. Um, but I had seen a car at a checkpoint, which was a decision point in the course, maybe two kilometres back. Um, mm. So I made the decision to run back and get that person. And then we got forward, uh, sprung forward to the guy and were able to pick him up. And he did go to hospital. Um, yeah. But yeah, it just kind of got me thinking that, you know, I think things yeah. can get very litigious. Yeah. Um, I think especially these days, <laughs> event organisers have a lot to compete with. So being able to provide um, a really good, solid, robust um, first aid service with emergency management plans for how we're going to extract people if we need to. It just gives race directors that reassurance that, um, you know, we can go out there into the middle of, uh, you know, Victorian Alpine country and stage these races and let people see these phenomenal sites. You know, they can head across Crosscut Saw and we've still got people who are prepared to go out there on foot to go and help them if they've got a broken ankle or they get bitten by a snake. So I think that's where it came from is. Hmm. Yeah. Um, just to take a step back, to what is your work background? Ah, that's, <laughs> that's how long have you got? Um, <laughs> the, I, the, the short version. The short version, I'm a registered nurse. Um, so I just have, I think, throughout my 20-odd year career in nursing, um, you can wear a lot of hats as a nurse. Um, it's a really broad field and you can engage in a variety of different areas. But my the particular areas that I've tended to uh, be drawn to are the areas of emergency management, uh, critical care, resuscitation, um, advanced life support, all that kind of stuff. And then when I amalgamated all yeah. of that stuff with um, my love of the outdoors and trail running, I ventured out into doing uh, qualifications in major incident medical management, um, hospital major incident medical management, advanced wilderness life support, uh, trauma, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. at the moment, um, I think with nursing, you're always learning. There's always something to learn, and I'm continuing to study. So I'm working towards a nurse practitioner um, qualification at the moment. Um, but, yeah, that is my primary background, just a, a critical care registered nurse. Yeah. 
What do you think, uh, what would you say is the biggest difference between the service that you um, offer to race directors and what is a standard first aid um, service? Uh, I think <clears throat> there was really a call. A lot of race directors started to have the conversation with me when I'd floated the idea of, of having a medical service. Um, and I think our major point of difference is our team of people who are trail runners or are experienced hikers uh, who can I can comfortably put them out in the middle of the wilderness for three days and know that they can be self-sufficient. Um, and that gives us that capacity and the ability to really cover those those big endurance athletic events and the remote area athletic events. Um, if you look at some of the other major metropolitan services um, or first aid services, you know, their bread and butter might be covering um, food festivals or music festivals um, and all that kind of stuff. Whereas our, we are very unique to uh, those endurance athletic events. And that's our, that's our really big point of difference. We understand those events from a participant point of view from a race director point of view uh, and from an athlete point of view. So I think uh, if you were to engage another service um, and you give them the, I guess the vignette of it's a mountain event with a thousand participants that covers a hundred kilometers, majority of services would um, possibly sit at the finish line and, and wait until someone was presented to them. Whereas we mm. will proactively go out and uh, aim to keep people out on course. We're, we're not just there to patch you up if you've injured yourself. We're there to engage with um, and talk to us. If you're 50 kilometres in and you're starting to feel a gut ache, talk to us. We might be able to make some suggestions. Uh, we might be able to, to offer you some form of therapy that might be able to placate that and, and keep you going. So we don't just want to provide a first aid service, which is reactive when there's treatment yeah. needed. We want to be proactive and help people achieve and, and finish these events. Sounds great. So um, just say, for instance, um, so we've talked about what's, what you offer to athletes. In what situations should an athlete seek your help during the race? Anything, for any reason at all. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that can bring people unstuck and it could be something as simple as a blister that goes untreated or a hot spot. Yeah. Uh, a hot spot, if you intervene early and get some barrier protection over it, it prevents it from becoming a blister and, I don't know, I'm sure, Izzy, you've had your fair share of blisters oh, yeah. in your yeah. time and Ron as well. It's, it can be something as simple as that that can really just make the rest of your race just awful, absolutely okay. awful. So um, yeah, we can engage with people just to help them with that, with simple blister management or um, at the extreme end, at the other end of the spectrum, it might be a 200-kilometre event and you've been awake for 48 hours or, or 30 hours and you're starting to hallucinate or, you, you know, you you're uh, starting to feel a bit disorientated or whatever it might be. So we're there just to make sure, you know, we know that you're not going to be in a great headspace. We know that you're going to be struggling. Um, you know, we anticipate sleep deprivation and uh, extreme exertion can cause hallucinations and things like that. And we will do an assessment of you to see whether we believe it's safe for you to continue. <laughs> um, is, is it too much of a risk that you're going to go wander way off course um, or, you know, there could be another medical issue harbouring in the background that could rear its ugly head and then completely derail you. So it can be, can be something very simple from a blister, stomach ache, headache, nausea, vomiting, uh, gastrointestinal upset from the other end. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are things that a lot of people present for and that will usually be a pre-existing injury or ITB or whatever it might be. And we're not a physiotherapy service, so... <laughs> There's not really anything we can do for you if you're in the middle of the race and your pre-existing ITB is giving you grief. We can offer you an ice pack, <laughs> um, but that's about it. We certainly can't fix those chronic, um, you know, musculoskeletal issues out there. But um, yeah, anything, anything inside the realm of first aid, uh, we can we can help you with. What's a really? Have you ever had like some really unusual injury? Yeah, very much so. Um, Ron was with us, I believe. We covered an event in New South Wales. Um, and unfortunately, there'd been, I, can, I think from memory, there'd been quite a bit of rain uh, leading into this event, which, as you know, makes branches really heavy. And uh, mm. the winner of the marathon event, and it's kind of like a figure eight course, this particular event. So this runner was on the last part of the figure eight course coming into the finish line in the centre. And uh, 
covered in blood, absolutely covered in blood. And we kind of ran to her to see what was going on. And she said, no, no, it's not me. And she gave us the brief that there was someone a couple of kilometres away who, who was injured quite severely. And we uh, sent a team out, which involved crossing rivers and a few other things. We got to her and a branch had come down on her head. Um, oh. And that was a really significant injury. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. And she was um, taken by helicopter to Westmead Hospital. Um, and all that kind of- so she was just underneath it and it just timed perfectly to fall on her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, From memory, um, I think a, a storm or a, a windstorm had come through suddenly. It was very sudden. Yeah. And yeah, and she got just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. So That's it's unbelievable bad luck. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But there can certainly be some freak accidents. Or, yeah. You know, you do think that, um, I mean, you're running. So the tallest person at 2.3 or 2.4 metres, that's that's as far as you're going to fall. But you can still, with a little bit of speed behind you and yes. smash, your, smash your front teeth out. We've had broken noses. Um, we've had pretty severe head lacerations. Um, just recently, we covered one race in particular where towards the end of the race, there was one one low branch <laughs> and the race organisers had done everything humanly possible to flag it and mark it and put tape all over it. And I think we must have treated 12 uh, head lacerations <laughs> in that particular event because you just, you're at the end of your race, you've got your head down, you just want to put one foot in front of the other and you think you've ducked enough, yeah. um, but they just hadn't. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can get some really bizarre um injuries and illnesses and and that's also um you know we do do a thorough medical survey before the races start so we're looking at Mm. we'll have people out there who are type 1 diabetics running with an insulin pump yeah and that's got a whole nother world um, to think about um any diabetic knows their diabetes better than anybody else and we don't we don't want to tell them how to treat their own diabetes because they live with it yeah and we understand that so we will take their their cues and their guidance but at the same time you know their diabetes on a daily basis might behave very differently when they're in a race and they're under race pressure and race stress and they've got elevated cortisol levels from stress and and all kinds of other things so we're there just to keep a watchful eye um, but at the same time jump in if they do declare and need our assistance and then you know with other races with people who've had triple bypass surgery and you know they're still out there doing ultra endurance events well, during the race that's quite a medical service you're offering there yeah (laughs) Yeah, so so we've got to keep an eye on these people in particular and and so we do do a survey just to go okay well do we have any um particularly high risk people out there that we need to be extra cautious of yeah that's that's great yeah Yeah. that you do that yeah um now what would you say to people who question the need for mandatory equipment you know question the need to carry it are you ready with the sensor button? <laughs> <laughs> I thought this one might evoke a response. <laughs> You're triggering me, Ron. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, it's mandatory for a reason. And, I, we, God, we had um, someone cut a snake bandage to, down to, you know, in, in quarters because they just wanted to save that couple oh, of hundred yeah. extra grams in their pack kind of thing. And I just... Sometimes I'm just lost for words in those circumstances. Um, a snake bandage is the length that it is because it needs to go up and down the the average adult uh, limb. Yeah. Mm. So to cut it down to, you know, 30 centimetres for the sake of trying to tick the mandatory gear box but save a couple of hundred grams in the pack, just that mm-hmm. kind of blows my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, the race directors go through so much to be able to stage these events. And I think a lot of runners don't really understand what the race directors go through and how much red tape they have to jump through and how many hoops, you know, red tape they have to get through really and how many hoops they have to jump through just to be able to do this. So, um, you know, when, when runners kind of do argue or challenge the mandatory gear or, in fact, go out without the mandatory mm. gear and then present a problem that we have to deal with, that seriously jeopardises, um, you know, the feasibility of running those events again. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about it is, and it might be something that runners don't even think about, but look at townships like Bright, for example. There's a lot of mountain running events in Bright. Bright has a very, very tiny urgent care centre. And that urgent care centre is typically just staffed by one nurse with a doctor on call. And that's, on any given day, probably enough for the township of Bright. But when you add 
a thousand competitors plus yes. maybe three or four hundred spectators into the township of Bright. And we always end up treating spectators as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then say even just five percent of that of you know of that group of, or mass of people need some kind of medical assistance and want to present to the urgent care centre, you've just overwhelmed the local resources. Hmm. And when you overwhelm the local resources, you take that away from the people who live in that township. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're going out there to do a mountain event in one of these local townships and you're not doing the right thing by carrying your mandatory gear and because you're not carrying your mandatory gear and you do get bitten by a snake or and you don't have the appropriate, you know, um, gear to treat yourself, and t- temporarily until we can get to you or say it's minus four degrees and you've been running for 10 kilometers and now you're wet and you're starting to get hypothermic and you haven't got your bivy bag or your space blanket or your extra polypropylene layers or whatever it might be then you're not just putting yourself at risk but you are putting the people who are coming out to rescue you at risk and you're putting other competitors in the race at risk um mm-hmm. so i think yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> when I get challenged with people who uh, want to argue the mandatory year, um, yeah, it's, it is very challenging. Oh, look, and as can I just say, as a competitor in a race, I find it really frustrating because I'm lugging all that weight around. And then I've been in races where I've spoken with people and they're like, oh, no, I got it checked, but I didn't bring it with me. And I think that's not fair, like, for the rest of us that are carrying the weight. Like, Absolutely, we're, doing, yeah. we're all doing the right thing, and you're just sauntering along, and and yeah. and I just think it's it's, it's cheating. It's cheating. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's absolutely cheating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I really strongly advocate that race directors do spot checks. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm always really appreciative when race directors do spot checks because a, at least I've got the reassurance of knowing people have got their gear out there, um, whether they have done it of their own due course or whether they're only carrying it because they have the threat of being spot checked. Um, either way, from my perspective, yeah. it means they've got it on them. So I'll take that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing. If race directors can muster the volunteer capacity to be able yeah. to do spot checks, then, then we're all for it and we will gladly support it. Yeah. Now, what about when people are just hitting the trails, you know, um, we'll talk about summer for the moment. Should they take um, some sort of basic first aid kit with them? Yeah, look, I would always advocate it. it, it just to, It's up to really, the onus is on each individual person to be aware of their surroundings, what territory are they heading into. If I was going to go out for a run along, say, the Two Bays Trail this weekend on my own, I would absolutely take snake bandages because I know that there are some black spots along that course where you don't necessarily get phone reception. Mm. Um, and I, if I had an in-reach device, like a small Garmin in-reach device, in-reach device, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate because I have a sat phone, so I would take the sat phone if I was heading out to that area. But um, I'm also cursed in that I think if there's snakes out there, they tend to find me and gravitate <laughs> towards me. Don't worry, they find Ron too. I've yeah. seen so many snakes since I've been running with him. Yeah. <laughs> But I think it's just, you know, but then again, if I'm just going to go for a local run down the Peninsula Link Trail or, or you know, wherever it is or, a, you know, a national park or something like that that's got well-defined big open fire trails, um, you know, then I might not, you know, burden myself with that kind of gear. So it's up to each individual person um, just to take that responsibility and have that, have that ownership on your own personal safety while you're out there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, just back on on EMS, what sort of um, staff do you have at any given race? You know, what what's the the variation in you know because they're not all doctors. Yeah, sure. Right? So we have um, we have docs, obviously. We have registered nurses um, and and a varying types and, and specialties. Uh, and we have paramedics. Um, we have people who've done wilderness first aid training. Um, and just general um, HLT uh, first aid courses. Um, and we have just recently started to take on student paramedics as well, okay. um, which is really good. It it's, you know, yeah. gives them a bit of a feel for it and, and mm-hmm. just some clinical ex- uh, exposure. Yeah. Um, so we always do an assessment of any event first and foremost. We, we do a risk assessment. Um, we look at the local uh facilities and the local resources like bright for example with the you know the what i was just talking about before um and then we make an assessment on how many competitors do we expect how many spectators do we expect what's the weather likely to be um do we have reasonable access can we get vehicles to 
majority of the course or is the majority of the course really remote and our only way in or out is on foot? Um, and then that guides how many staff we have, uh, the level of staff that we have, um, you know, and the advanced expertise and qualifications. So a 1,000 people running uh, in metropolitan Melbourne for a 10K run, that might only need, say, four first aiders because you've got so many local resources available to you and there's very little. The worst thing that's going to happen is cuts and scratches, really. Yeah. Um, but the same 10-kilometre event for a 1,000 people in the township of Bright might warrant more people because or just a higher level of expertise so that we don't have to necessarily burden, um, you know, the local resources. About how many races do you attend a year? Uh, well, it's getting up there now. Yeah. Um, we're up to about 16, 16 or 17. Um, so we have a really heavy race calendar from uh, February through till May. Yeah. Um, there's almost a race every weekend. And then we obviously peter off over the winter period and then it starts to pick up again August, September. Because I was um, going to say, I mean, in Australia, we can have a pretty much year-round race calendar. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And we have been approached by quite a lot of um, races in New South Wales as well who are, uh, would like us to go and cover. And there, there's more uh, races in New South Wales through the June through August yes. period, whereas there really is very little in Victoria um, mm -hmm. over those months. Oh, that's awesome, though. Yeah. Yeah, to a degree, because we all yeah. work full-time jobs. Yes. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, how the heck do you fit it all in? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, you know, just kind of I think it's gotten a little bit bigger than what we originally anticipated, which we love. Um, but, yeah, it is, it's, it's a business that's grown out of hobby, which grew yeah. out of a passion. So, mm, yeah. Lovely. Um, now, th this might be a good time also to mention what you've already mentioned. Um, you do have your own race that you put on. It's coming up. Yeah, uh, not anymore. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so the beer run, um, or Sharpie's beer run, we've yeah. had that race for... Oh, God, when did that start, Ron? 2015. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the first year of that race. So we've had six runnings of that race, and uh, it's a local race uh, on the Mornington Peninsula and Arthur Seat Trails, um, a 10K and a 21K, uh, and it's sponsored by Mornington Peninsula Brewery. Um, so hence the beer run. Uh, we get a little bit of beer and on course and at the finish line, which is always great for competitors. Um, and it's optional, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I think we've just, I've just recently um, sold the beer run. Oh, congratulations, uh, I guess. Thank you, which is, yeah. and look, I love the event. And as uh, like we were just saying before, I would love to keep doing it. But, you know, Ron, yourself from race directing it, that it does take an enormous amount yes. of time and energy. Yes. And with a re really heavy EMS uh, calendar mm -hmm. from Jan through to May, um, it just made trying to do those events. Sorry, your time. your volumes just dropped down for some reason. Oh, sorry. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? Yeah, yes, that's, that's better. better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Um, yeah, I think it, the race calendar just got way too busy for me to try and stage a race at the same time as be mm -hmm. at a different race every weekend doing the medical. Because obviously a, a race, people maybe don't, and like, like you said, they don't understand how much a race director goes through because it's not just the weekend of that you required to work there's lots of weekends before um leading up into it and and i know many race directors who as soon as the race is finished they're already starting the plans for the next year so yeah definitely it's months in. it's months and months and months of work and even yeah. after you've even after you've built the race and then you know you hope the next year and the year after that will be kind of plug and play yeah, there's still milestones that you have to hit. So, you know, yeah. the permits have got to be in by this date. The yes. medals have got to be ordered by this date. The toilets have got to be booked. The parks permits got to go through. Um, and then there is, I think, the one thing is that constant liaison with competitors. Yeah. Um, you know, that if you've got a thousand competitors, I reckon probably 600 of those are going to want a personal message or some kind or have a yeah. question that they want answered. And, and it's just keeping on trying to keep on top of that. Um, you know, that PR side of things as well, which gets really time consuming. So there's a lot involved. Plus when you add in a liquor license, um, yeah. that takes yeah. it to a whole new level. Yeah. And a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was fun. I think that was probably the best and worst day of my life, to be honest. 
the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic on uh, the 12th of March, the day before the beer run. Yes. <laughs> and they state the government announced a 500 cap limit. And I reckon yeah. I had 500 competitors ring me <laughs> on that day yeah. oh <laughs> asking God. if we were still going ahead. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we went into lockdown the Monday after. Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Geez, you timed that to perfection. Yeah, that was that was big. <laughs> that was big. But I mean, we had, there was no community transmission whatsoever then. You know, no. not like now. Yeah. yeah. So it's funny to think about it in retrospect, isn't it? Because there's so much community transmission at the moment, and yet we're still allowed to proceed with events. But yeah. when this whole thing kicked off two years ago, but I guess it was also you know working it all out and finding out and learning and and you know yeah and absolutely two, year, two years on we. Yeah, we can't be in lockdown still, you know. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, would you have um, any advice for for runners when they're hitting the trails? Any advice you could give them for for keeping themselves safe? Um, I think just going back to what we said before, uh, being mindful of the territory that you're headed into. If you're going somewhere and you don't, if you don't know if there's phone reception, um, think about if you, especially if you're going trails. Think about getting one of those uh, in-reach devices that can push out an emergency text message. Yeah. Um, making sure that whoever you do have as your emergency contact is aware that yeah. they're your emergency contact. <laughs> we've yeah. had a few um, circumstances where we've needed to phone people's emergency contacts and the response has been, I don't know why they've got me listed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I go running with him occasionally, but that's about oh, it. Wow. You know? So. Yeah, so that can be really challenging. It's a bit sad, actually. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that can be really sad. challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so make sure you've got an emergency contact in your phone. Um, yeah. You know, if you're going out for a run, uh, take your snake bandage if need be. Make sure you've got enough water or if you don't want to carry stuff with you, then plan your route um, so that you've got somewhere where you can stop for water breaks. Um if you're going remote and you're going into a bush, consider carrying a life straw yeah. so that you can access, um, you know, you've got water that you can access. Um, and just, yeah, just taking that ownership and responsibility for where you're going and your own safety. And then say on another note, if, if an athlete <clears throat> is told that they need to be pulled from or, you know, need to, you, you say that you recommend they don't finish um, what should a, an athlete take into consideration when they're told that, like, to help them perhaps understand it better? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think in the all the years that we've been doing this, we've only had to do that twice. Oh, um, wow. Which that's is a great. good thing. We really, really do our very best. We There's no personal gain for us to remove you from course. No. Hmm. Um, there's no gain to anybody if we have to stop your race. And we really, really don't want to have to do that. Um, but at the same time, a lot of our guys have been out there and they've done these races. And I know that there's a mentality of, oh, I'm going to finish even if I have to crawl bleeding across yeah. the finish line. And yeah. I get that grit and I, we get understand people having that determination and having that. But do you want to jeopardise your next six months worth of racing or your next nine months or 12 months worth of racing to do that? Um, and sometimes what might not be obvious to you is very obvious to someone with a medically trained eye. Yeah. Um, you know, we have stopped um, someone from competing or from finishing a multi-day event um, because there was a severely infected great toenail. Oh. Um, mm. And, you know, the response was, oh, but it's okay, it actually feels pretty numb, which is even more of a red flag. <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, we had to say, look, I understand you're walking on it and you feel like you can run and that there's nothing else about you that feels unwell, but you need to appreciate that there is absolutely infection there. And, you know, the longer that that exists there and the deeper that that infection goes, and we think we can see a bit of a channel under the skin and there's potential for that to turn into osteomyelitis, which is infection of the bone. And mm. if that's the case, you can severely jeopardize, you know, your running future if you're going to damage um, your foot or your great toe, which you need significantly for your balance so you know we know it's a tough pill to swallow um, and we really really do try not to um, put runners in that situation but if we are asking you um, to stop your race then we, we are doing it for good reason 
And yeah. that's the most important thing to remember. Yeah, well, and we're doing it. We're doing it not only from a medical point of view, but we're doing it from a running point of view. We're trying to um, make sure that you're going to get some longevity and that you're going to continue to run. You know, if you've got significant shin splints that you've been nursing and you've towed the start line knowing that they weren't up to scratch and they weren't ready, um, we'll, we'll, we'll absolutely advocate that you don't continue to run on it because all you're going to do is make it worse. And even though you might get that momentary, I guess, mental health relief of having done the run and achieved what you wanted to achieve, what's the damage for the next six or nine months? So, and, and what's the mental health damage too if you can't run for the next six to exactly. nine months? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah a DNF is a tough pill to swallow, but if we do yeah. ask it, then it's for good reason. Hmm. Yeah. Do you ever just encourage someone to DNF and, and then leave the choice up to them? Yeah, we, we, we call it planting the seed. <laughs> <laughs> so we do... Ultimately, we would always prefer it be the runner's decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it might take 20 minutes with a blanket on sitting around a fireplace with a cup of soup to let them come to that decision themselves and just offer the education um, and the rationale behind it and, and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, we do try and hopefully get the runner to come to that decision themselves. Now, on the flip side of the coin, do you ever have any runners who kind of really want you to tell them that they should stop? Yep. And you know <laughs> that they can keep going and you're just like handing them that cup of concrete. Do you ever have yeah. to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've had quite a lot of people. We have a lot of people who just say, oh, no, nah, it's not. It's not my day. Yeah. And, and, and we're happy to say, well, hang on a minute. Why? Why is it not your day? What's wrong? Are your legs okay? Yep. Okay. Is your tummy okay? Yep. Okay. Well, what's, what is it? What, what's, why is it not your day? If you're too hot, you're too cold, what's going on? And, you know, nine times out of 10, just a little bit of um, emotional support and they can yep. get back out there again. And, and we've helped a lot of people um, finish their race when otherwise um, I think if we hadn't have been out there, they would have thrown the towel in. So, yeah. and we've got, particularly we um, have, uh, run medics so we'll have medics out on course with a pack on who will be out there doing the event at the same time as the competitors um and you know in particular julie uh julie savage who's one of our run medics and and karen mickle um they've helped countless people finish their races just by being out there and being a support for them to just keep moving forward so yeah i and, think we do those people ever come up and thank you guys later oh absolutely Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah, yeah, they're really grateful just to have someone to talk to out there just to get them yeah. over those hard bits and those hurdles. And, um, yeah, yeah, they're usually really grateful. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. true. All righty. Well, um, that's, I think that's a nice positive note to, to finish that on. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, oh, no problem. Really today. enjoyed it. And, and um, we encourage people, you know, to say hi to Deb if, if they see her out there or any of the EMS staff to say hi, you know. And it's always good to say thank you as well. Thank yeah. you for being there. Oh, no, we're, we're, we'd be there anyway, I think, Ron, <laughs> regardless <laughs> of whether we were, you know, whether yeah. we're working there or not. It's, it's just yeah. the community that we love to be around. So Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's a great community, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. All righty, well, thanks so much for that. No worries. Take care. Bye. Bye.